uh, into the audience. Um, the good thing I'd like to say is that I encourage people to uh, shout out, and, well, not shout out, but interrupt and ask questions while I'm going along. Um, generally, if something's uh, confusing, or well, it doesn't make sense, it, it's probably because I'm not explaining it properly. So uh, it's probably quite something very simple, so uh, just interrupt and, uh, and tell me. And I'll try the best I can to, to make things sound simple. Hi. So, the London Python Code is a community organized uh, monthly meeting of Python dudes, basically. Um, and my aim in this presentation is to tell you what we get up to, uh, ultimately, so that uh, the last question I'm going to ask of you is going to be, are you going to go away and organize a Python code dojo? I hope to see lots of hands uh, raised. Um, so, before I start, I want to tell you a little bit about me, uh, just so that you can see um, where I'm coming from, why I have the particular context that I have, um, particular interest in the dojo. So I uh, trained as a musician, classically trained musician. I trained at the Royal College of Music in London, and I played professionally as well. Um, I did an academic music degree, a uh, rather performance degree, so I did lots of music theory, composition, <coughs> analysis, history of music, things like that. Um, and I also met my lovely wife at the Royal College of Music, and uh, not wanting to be, um, <laughs> to be uh, uh, suffering from my art, I decided to become a teacher instead, because that was a far more regular salary. Um, so I became a music teacher, and I taught mainly um, rather tough teenagers in inner city schools in London, just outside of London. Um, but I also had experience teaching um, Tiny Tots from five years old, and I also did quite a number of adult education classes in music theory as well. So uh, I've done a lot of teaching, basically my 20s were spent teaching young people about music. And um, while I was doing that, I did a degree, um, an MA in philosophy of education. Uh, because I was interested in um, the ideas behind education. And uh, my dissertation was an account of the concept of creativity. Because as a music teacher, um, people say, you've got to learn to do music because it helps you become creative. And uh, there, weren't many, there weren't many people actually questioning, well, what does creativity mean? What is the process? Um, things like that. So there's a bit of philosophy of education there. Um, I, uh, I went on to do an, uh, an MSc in computing while I was doing that. Um, I supported myself by writing articles for Computer Shopper in the UK. Um, so I wouldn't trust anything that those guys say in their reviews. Um, and I'm also writing a book for a ride at the moment. Uh, so I eventually I tumbled into software development. Um, the first job I ever got was as a .NET guy, um, even though I've been using open source technology all the way up until then. Uh, and since uh, I only had uh, .NET as a professional kind of thing on my CV, I, I ended up doing uh, quite a lot of .NET, um, about five or six years worth. Um, and in the end, I saved up enough money to be able to take about three months off, three six months off, and I learned Python instead, and then got a job off and so on and so forth. So I've been using Python for about three years, and I'm currently working at Building Fund, which is uh, the uh, unfundable world-changing startup, as Robert Scoble calls it. Uh, so today, what are we going to do? Uh, well, I've got to explain to you <laughs> what is a dojo. I'm going to do that two ways, uh, the official version, um, and then what we actually get up to in the London dojo. Uh, I'm going to address uh, why you might want to attend the dojo, uh, because some people uh, can't see the point of it. Um, then I'm going to ask some philosophical questions. You know, what is a good dojo? I'm going to look at that from two points of view, uh, from that of the attendee and from that of the um, I hesitate to use the word organizer because it's kind of, um, well, it self-organizes, but from the guy standing at the front trying to get people to do things. Uh, and then I'm going to conclude with, uh, with some personal observations as well. So uh, without further ado, well, what exactly is a dojo? Uh, so uh, as I'm sure you know, dojo is a term uh, borrowed from martial arts, and basically it's a place where you go to practice stuff. Uh, I feel a little bit uncomfortable about this name because uh, you know, people, when you say it's a dojo, they think there's going to be fighting or something like that, and uh, it most certainly isn't. Um, anyway, it was invented by some French dudes in Paris um, around December 2004, uh, and they have a very simple philosophy, uh, which you can read all about at the codingdojo.org website that they set up, and basically um, acquiring coding skills should be a continuous process. Um, I'd also add that improving existing skills is, uh, is also important. Um, and the assumption that they're making, which I, I, uh, I hope you will agree with, is that a, a good developer is always learning and reevaluating in order to improve their technique and uh, obviously their value as well. So in the end, um, going to a code dojo means uh, deliberately practicing. That isn't me, by the way. But I am too with that. Um, so these are old ideas. 
uh, Socrates, the father of Western philosophy, uh, said that the unexamined life is not worth living. Um, I mean, it's good to be in a continuous process of examination, re-examination, of this two and a half thousand years old. Um, and uh, Heraclitus, the grumpy old man of ancient Greek philosophy, uh, said, much learning does not teach understanding. In other words, uh, don't just read the book. You know, go and do something practical. Okay. So, uh, the Parisian guys, they came up with rather a structured way of doing a dojo, um, as you might expect in French. So, <laughs> so I'll take you through it. Um, you can safely ignore the top three things, which are all kind of really bureaucratic. Um, the interesting ones are the lower two uh, blue and red portions, um, where it says 40 minutes code, either prepared or rendered or recata. Um, and that's where the action starts. So, a uh, kata. Uh, what exactly is a kata? Well, a kata is again another term that the, the Parisian guys borrowed from, um, from martial arts, and it basically means forms. And uh, in the context of martial arts, it's uh, sort of choreographed steps to be practiced again and again and again and again. So it improves your muscle memory. So uh, the theory is, and I used to do a little bit of karate, is that when someone tries to punch you in your face, you instinctively do a drop like that. Whatever you're supposed to do. It's been years since I did karate. I'm not going to do any more. Um, <laughs> another way of thinking about it, moving from a musical background, is that it's a bit like the scales and arpeggios and two that uh, musicians practice again and again and again and again. The good thing about this sort of process is that these can be graded in difficulty and focus on particular different aspects of whatever it is that you're, you're practicing. Um, and one thing while I was a music student that uh, was, uh, <laughs> uh, I won't get into me. Uh, many a time was uh, it's important to practice correctly. Um, there's no point just playing a piece of music or practicing a cat. You've got to sit back and think, well, what did I achieve when I was doing that? Okay. Um, and uh, in in the context of a code dojo, uh, basically a kata means self-contained uh, program puzzle, quite small and simple. Um, and in the London, in the in the Paris code dojo, uh, they uh, illustrate this two mechanisms of doing a kata. Um, so the first way that they do a kata is what's called the prepared kata. Um, this isn't a photo from Code Dojo, by the way. Um, so I'll, I'll just read out the slide to you. So the presenter shows how to solve a particular well-defined problem using test-driven development and baby steps. Um, and before the presenter can go on to the next step, um, that step must make sense to everybody. And it must be done in silence, because you don't want to break the concentration of the person who is giving the presentation. And the only reason that these were, you were allowed to interrupt is if you don't understand what's going on. Okay? So it's a bit like a formal lesson at school where somebody maybe doing chalk and talk type uh, explanation at you. Uh, the second type of kata that, uh, that the guys in Paris uh, came up with it's something called a randori kata, uh, and this is actually a photo from the dojo. And any more photos that you see will be uh, taken uh, from um, ones that I managed to snatch whilst at the dojo. Um, so basically, it works like this: uh, it's um, it's sort of iterative public pair programming using task driven development. So each pair has a time slot, and it's a pilot and co-pilot, um, and uh, the pilot basically describes what. Uh, what's going on. Nobody's allowed to interrupt. Only the co-pilot is allowed to ask questions or offer comments and things like that. Um, and uh, at the end of their time slot or whatever uh, we decide to do to sort of um, bound them into sort of the coding session, at the end of that time uh, the co-pilot becomes the new pilot. Uh, the pilot goes back into the audience and there's a happy volunteer to join, uh, to join in and uh, become the new co-pilot. Uh, Okay, that's voice space, Michael Ford, and uh, there's John Ribbons, uh, or Kate, if you know, to be known, uh, is the co-pilot, and uh, that's um, Tim, uh, who's a Python core developer as well, um, that, who's, gonna, who's got a rather sneaky smile on his face. Um, the important thing to also notice is that, you know, when you, um, or, well, when I uh, learned to drive, I was asked to sort of give uh, a running commentary on what I was thinking about, uh, probably for the... Uh, 
for the nerves. It's my driving instructor. So, you know, you drive driving along, you say, okay, I can see the junction coming along, so I'm going to look in my mirror, okay, I'm going to signal I'm driving left, I'm going to apply the brakes, and I'm going to just slow down a bit sooner because I can see there's somebody walking across the road, and blah, 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 blah. So you do that sort of things while you're coding along. So I, I can see I've got this problem. I'm going to, first of all, write a unit test that just you know, uh, test this specific thing, I'm going to move up to the real, real code, just pack something that it works okay, I'm going to put it back, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so you work like that. So that's basically how a dojo is supposed to work, um, as defined by uh, the French dudes in, in, in Paris. Uh, so um, what is a dojo um, in London? Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about how, how the dojo started. Um, we have a meeting in London every so often called the uh, Pipe and Pisser, that's P-Y-S-S-U-P, -S -S which is a pub meeting, basically a social gathering. Um, and I was chatting to Jonathan Hartley um, about being a musician and how in, uh, in music you have uh, masterclasses. So you go up on stage, uh, there is some maestro there, um, and you play in front of your peers. And then the maestro takes you to pieces. Um, really, and it's it's part of being a music student. And when I say it takes you to pieces, I mean that in a positive way as well. Um, although I have seen people reduce it, it has been more due to their insecurity rather than the maestro being a bit of an idiot. Um, generally, they're very good. Um, so Jonathan responded by saying, "What well, have you heard about COVID? That's a little bit like that. You kind of get up and you code, and it's in, in public, and people see what you're doing." And blah, 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 blah. So we organised um, our first meeting. And we really did try hard at the start to follow the Parisian rules. Um, but like the slide says, we didn't know what we were doing, and um, we did really stick to the rules. Um, the first mistake was uh, that we started the evening with pizza and beer. Um, and this didn't really set the scene for a calm and thoughtful coding session, which is kind of what we were hoping. But um, it was quite good. Um, we had lots of geek socialising, and people meeting old friends, and uh, we had pizza and beer. And we had about 25 people turn up, um, and we chose to do the Randori Kata, so the pair program. Okay? Uh, and the rule that we had uh, was that you had 10 minutes or a passing unit test for each pair. Uh, and this worked quite well, uh, but like I said, we didn't know what we were doing. Um, and we made several mistakes. Um, the first of which is that we only had two editors available, uh, the really friendly Emacs and Dim. Um, and I think the first person up there hadn't used either of them for years. Um, so we spent a lot of time faffing about with editors, basically. Uh, we didn't have a standard keyboard. We were using this laptop, which is a, a UK Mac, which has a double quotes uh, in the wrong place. Um, and Axe is in the wrong place as well. So people were typing furiously, and it all just wouldn't work because everything was in the wrong place. Um, we chose to do a Twitter-based cata because we thought that was something people would find interesting, but it was just too difficult, too complicated, basically. You know, um, it was hard to do. Uh, it was hard because we couldn't do uh, an iterative uh, build-up of tests, working code tests, working code tests, working code in small steps. It seemed to be a kind of an all or nothing type thing. So we had several groups which hit the 10-minute um, boundary, and the next iteration had to take over to try and pass that unit test. Um, and that meant only six or seven people got a chance to actually do any code as well. Uh, but happily, we got it to work. Uh, basically, we were pulling down um, data from Twitter, and we were trying to build um, a, a visualization of the, the person's followers. Um, other stuff that wasn't supposed to happen at the um, first meeting of the London Python Code Dojo uh, was spontaneous applause for working code, which was really <laughs> quite cool. Uh, lots of audience participation, like people just interrupting and going, no, don't do it like that. What you want to do is do it like this. Um, in fact, we had at one point, we had three really interesting conversations happening in the room, and I had to just sort of stop someone over there and look, let's listen to what this guy has to say, and then we'll come to you. And I was doing my kind of back to school teacher thing. Yeah. <laughs> um, so there was lots of discussion and debate, and it was generally a noisy time. Remember, I said that in the Paris Dojo, they kind of uh, emphasized a quiet, silent, thoughtful reflection and things like that. Uh, and unfortunately, it, it wasn't like that at all in the London Dojo. Sorry about that. Um, but in the plenary at the end, uh, we thought that this was really, really good stuff. Gautier, do you want to just put your hand up? OK, that is Gautier's fault. Um, <laughs> in the discussion at the end, we actually thought that the 
interaction and the interruption and the shouting out and things like that was actually a positive aspect of the meeting. Um, when I say people were shouting out and saying, no, don't do it like that, it wasn't done in a nasty way. It was done because they could see that some, there was some problem happening and we would stop and we would talk about it. And it was really quite, um, yeah, it was quite fun doing that. Um, so we continued to do Randall based Cata for a few months um, until Dave, uh, one of our members, had a great idea. I'm not sure if you can see that. Um, but basically, uh, he had a presentation that he wanted to give and he wanted to practice doing that. And so uh, he wanted to present it to the dojo because we're a friendly group of people. Uh, it's a kind of about Python development, so we're, we're kind of subject experts as well. And we're nice guys and we get criticism and everything. And actually, at the same meeting, um, Kieran, who is another um, attendee at the dojo, suggested uh, that wouldn't it be great if rather than um, doing around Roy Kata, we split up into small groups to solve the problem that we had in hand. Um, he didn't actually like the fact that only six or seven people got a chance to do any coding in the evening. And he also pointed out that some attendees uh, didn't want to code in front of everyone, but, uh, but were happy to code in smaller groups. Yeah, um, I hope we better wait for um, the, the mic. Uh, sorry, I might have missed what you mentioned this. So the point of this is in two hours or three hours to, to solve one application among the group? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll explain exactly what happens in the group stuff um, in a second. But yeah, we're all given a... Did that happen in the Parisian dojo as well? No, um, no. Um, Not the group-based stuff. The, the only thing that's, as far as I can tell, the only thing that happens in the Parisian dojo is either the, um, the baby steps uh, presented kata or the randori kata prepared programming iterations. So do they solve like project boiler problems or what? Um, there would be things like, um, they're just small self-contained problems that you could solve in an hour, and often they would be used to illustrate a particular aspect of the program, something like that. So, um, I don't know, Peter Latin would translate, for example, um, just so that you got used to doing string manipulation or something like that, yeah. Um, but good question. Okay, so we had instantly um, two new dodo formats. Okay, so the first format that, that we had upon Dave's suggestion was the show and tell dojo. So Dave did his presentation and some of the people stepped up because they wanted to tell us about things. Um, and this is Rene, who is a high game core developer, and he seemed to plug everything but the kitchen sink into his laptop and he proceeded to tell us all about how we could control this from high game, which is really, really cool. Um, it, it's more like a, more like a seminar. Um, than presentations. So we encourage people to interrupt, to ask questions, to debate, to code along as well. We've had several people to code along when a, when a library has been presented. Um, but to point out problems and generally not to just sit there. Um, in other words, participation is expected. Uh, what's happening at the moment is you're all kind of just sitting there apart from one guy um, and you're listening to me and nobody's actually come back to me. In the dojo, there will be people with their laptops out following on one another following along as I'm coding along and trying to present something. Um, they might be asking questions, pointing things out, etc., etc. Um, so the second type of dojo uh, that we came up with, which was uh, Kieran's idea, was the team dojo. Yes, Christian, that's you. <laughs> um, now, uh, in the UK, we had, um, we had a really cool program called the Great Egg Race, where um, teams from science departments and uh, universities in the UK but were given an egg and they had to get it from A to B, uh, but they were given uh, a particular problem um, that got in their way, like they had to fire it over a canyon, or there was a stretch of water, or they had to put it on a self-motorized car, or something like that. Okay, so it's kind of a scientific problem. Um, and you all know what scrappy challenges or junkyard wars or whatever it is in the States. Yeah, it, it's, it's kind of like that. So basically, you're given a problem, and you have to solve it in a set period of time as a team. And um, what we do, there we go. Uh, during the pizza and the beer part of uh, the evening, when we're doing our group dojo, um, people go up to the blackboard or whiteboard uh, and they write down a whole list of problems that seem interesting. Um, and then before we start the coding session, uh, we take a vote. Um, so this is a really low maintenance dojo in terms of organisation. Uh, we take a vote um, and then we split into teams of about five or six uh, and all the teams. Um, to uh, solve the problem at the same time. And this takes about one and a half hours. And it generally gets very, very noisy. Um, and uh, 
I'm just shouting out that sort of half hour interval is how long you've got left. Um, and at the end, uh, we have um, a show, tell, and review session, which for me is, is my favourite part of the evening. Um, because everybody's heads in the same problem space, and there are five different teams about to show you how they solve the problem that you've been trying to attempt. And often they would have gone off on all sorts of extraordinary tangents that you couldn't have possibly imagined. Um, or they've done, they've used the same uh, sort of strategy as you, but they've done it differently. Or they've used a particular Python library that you weren't aware of, things like that. And uh, the other good thing about doing the show and tell is that it's important to be able to justify your design decisions um, and explain your code as well. Um, so presenting your code um, and having a, a live code review, basically, um, is, is a really good thing to have done. And um, it, it's usually very, very funny as well. Um, so why would you want to participate in, uh, in a code dojo? How does attending a dojo relate to our assumption? Um, that a good developer is always trying to develop themselves and learn and reevaluate and everything. Well, um, I hope the educational benefits um, of taking part in a dojo are obvious. Um, I'll go through these. So, obviously, you learn by practicing, by doing something, rather than just sitting there like you are and learning about a dojo. Um, fail safely with sympathy. Um, okay, so this sort of addresses uh, the comment that the guy in the Keynote last night was saying about how failure was essential if you want to learn in the dojo. Um, it's okay to fail. In fact, that's usually how I start it. And you're welcome to learn in code dojo. It's a safe place to really cock up because really you don't want to cock up at work and you can experiment um, and mess around. And in the show and tell, you can tell us how you cocked up spectacularly. And we'll all have learned something from that. Um, another important aspect of the dojo is you're working in groups and we have lots of different levels of Pythonistas in, uh, in the group and uh, so not only is it important for the newbies to sort of learn about Python but it's important for those advanced Python programmers to be able to explain what they're doing back to newbies. That in itself takes quite a bit of thought because although you might understand it, you've got to try and simplify this concept or this library or whatever it is this piece of code does, you've got to simplify this and explain it to this, this newbie Python program which, which shows quite a lot of level of skill. So being able to practice teaching is a really good skill, a really good opportunity. Um, and explaining yourself to peers, justifying your design decision, um, like I said in the um, uh, in the show and tell, it, it is, is obviously a very important thing to be able to do. Um, exploring each other's solutions, again in the show and tell, um, like I said, the advantages is that by the end of the group dojo, everybody's mind's in the same place. And there have been several occasions when I've thought, well, how the hell are they going to fix that problem? And then they've come up with something really elegant, or it sucks just as much as my solution, or my group solution. Um, and perhaps, you know, one of the most important aspects of the dojo is that we're building uh, we're building a community. Um, yeah? So, uh, I wanted to ask, because I'm really, really curious when doing something like this. I, I, live, I currently live in Plymouth, in yeah. the southwest. And I still haven't found people which would like to do it, but if I do, yeah. what does it take to, to, um, to build one, and what do I need to look for? Okay, I'll come to that. Thank you. Yeah, don't worry. Um, so, um, so like good open source developers, we, we took something, um, the Python, uh, the, uh, the code dojo rules from Paris, and we forked the concept and we adapted it um, to our own group dynamics. Okay. Um, so, uh, as I was saying, uh, community. Uh, the pizza and beer part of the, uh, of the evening is an important part of, uh, of community building for a start. Uh, people kind of relax over a pizza and a beer. Um, and people get to share war stories about what they've been up to, etc., etc. It's a good way to catch up with people as well. Um, and the other thing I'd like to say is that attendees, uh, like I said, abilities um, differ vastly. We've had we had a, a Ruby guy from Brazil just turn up on spec, and um, he just wanted to try out Python. So he didn't know anything about Python, but he was a program. We've had PHP guys. We've had people who weren't programmers, but they heard that Python was a good way to start. Right way through to people who were published authors um, using Python and things. In the social social part of the evening, everybody's kind of level because you're just sort of eating pizza and sharing a beer together. Um, 
So it's, it's a really good way to start the evening if everybody gets relaxed and, and so on. And you get to know your peers. Um, so, uh, a couple of philosophical questions. Uh, what is a good dojo? Um, well, I was thinking about this on the plane over here. Um, and as far as I can tell, from the attendees' perspective, um, it's fun to solve problems in a place where it is safe to make mistakes, and you're encouraged to show and tell what you're up to. So I'll just back that up. Um, okay. okay, it's fun. There are, you know, studies, thousands upon thousands, or maybe not thousands upon thousands, that say, you know, you're more conducive to learning new stuff if you're actually enjoying what you're doing. Um, people's experience at school probably backs that up. It's kind of common sense. So what we try and do is have fun at the dojo, so it's fun. Uh, to solve problems, awesome. Attendees get to go on that evil scientist trip while they're doing the dojo. Um, in a place where it's safe to make mistakes, celebrate failure. Um, you might think, well, why would you want to celebrate failure? Why would you want to try and make mistakes? Well, what do you think musicians do in a rehearsal? That's the whole point. You make a mistake in the rehearsal. So when you really need to do whatever it is, solve this problem when you're dense and cook, you think back, you know what? There was this guy, he tried it that way with the third gen, and it didn't work. Okay. So it's a safe place to make mistakes, because Jonathan's obviously doing that. Um, and it's great to get feedback and analyze and appraise, report. And obviously, Rafi here is, is showing uh, is, is teaching, which is a really great thing. And um, so what is a good dojo from an organizer's perspective? So I'm the guy that stands at the front um, to introduce the evening. As a result, I'm often misidentified as the organizer. Um, actually, the group sort of organizes itself. Um, but as you know, I have a background in education, music, and dance. Um, and so uh, I'm interested in trying to work out uh, what is it that makes the dojo work um, from the person who's trying to tell people what to do. Um, and so I'm reminded of something that a former professor of mine um, said to us in a lecture, and I'm paraphrasing this. Um, so this is Keith Swanick, who's um, very well known in music education circles. Um, so the effect of any educational activity should be to bring about a positive change in learners. Well, no shit, shall I? You know, um, obviously, you know, an educational experience is to sort of bring around um, a positive change in learners. Um, surely all learning situations are positive, and therefore they'll be, learn uh, they'll be fun and interesting and life-changing and things. Every teacher wants to be like Robin Williams at the Poet Society, and you're going to stand on your chairs at the end and quote Walt Whitman at me and things like that. But you know what? It doesn't really work like that sometimes. Um, that was staged, by the way. Um, often when you're in a talk, and this might have happened here at Europe, I think, uh, I know it's happened to me regularly um, throughout my learning career, that uh, you can be bored, not frustrated, distracted, the person who's trying to do the teaching or the explaining might not know what's going on or what they're doing. Um, and in fact, you know, although it's obvious that uh, you might want to be aiming for a positive experience. It certainly isn't universally practiced for lots of various reasons, either out of incompetence or, uh, or, well, or just because uh, the person is not a very nice teacher. And we all know at least one of those from our history. Um, so how can you tell it's going well in a dojo? Well, um, if it looks like that, um, you know you've got problems. Okay. Um, so how can you tell it's going right? Well, for me, it's the essence is, is this. There's some sort of positive aim, um, and something is happening to achieve this aim. And it's possible to measure that this aim is being met, i.e. there's some sort of feedback. Okay? And this can be generalized to any sort of learning situation. And if I were to change that um, and uh, explain that in the sense of, of the group-based dojo, um, that the aim is that we've, we've decided on a problem, we've all agreed on the aim, um, something is happening to fulfill that aim, so we work collaboratively in groups to solve the problem, and there's some sort of feedback, not only within the groups while you're doing the practical activity, but at the end when you do the show and tell, and people are giving you critique and suggestions, and you can get some sort of idea as to how well you've done. Okay? Um, so, I've been talking for about half an hour, and I'm coming to the end, so um, I'll end with some conclusions um, and personal observations. Um, so I'll assume everybody here wants to be a better, de a better developer, and one way to do this is to attend a dojo. 
Um, but this is only one way of, of improving this up. Um, and people who want to learn and improve uh, themselves are often looking for teachers. Um, I really like the definition of the expert from yesterday's keynote. Um, the same could be applied to teacher as well. Um, and uh, I'd like to say beware of uh, people who offer themselves as gurus or who promote some sort of a system or who offer pithy aphorisms that sound really cool and you think, ah, oh, yes, I'll practice that. Um, we have 500 years of music education history to draw upon when you're training a musician, and uh, music education is full of systems and pithy aphorisms and great teachers and not so great teachers, um, just to go through some of them. So, um, I'm going to move away from the microphone. And I'll just talk really loudly. <laughs> so, um, is this working? Yes, it is. Dark Cozy Rhythmics is a uh, movement to music. Um, Gradlestad Parnassum is a way of learning how to write counterpoint, which is how you put two very different melodies together and they get to sound really cool. Okay? That was invented 300 years ago, and I was taught how to do that when I was at Music Conservatory, so it's still um, a methodology that's used today. Um, modus novus is something that they inflict on, well, they inflicted it on me, it's ear training, atonal. Ear training, which means that it's not in a key, like the only if I say that you don't. Um, it's, it's atonal, it's, it's, it's horrible. <laughs> really? uh, the Kodai method, Kodai was an interesting guy. Um, and uh, he focused on working with little kids, uh, well, all sorts of musicians, but especially little kids. And he got them to learn hand signs. Um, I can't remember them now, but a uh, hand sign for each, uh, for each uh, note in a scale. And so as they were singing along, they would make the right hand sign for the note that they were singing at that time. Um, and that, uh, well, that helped them become very good singers for a start. Um, so that's the Kodai method. Paul Hindemith is a quite famous composer. Uh, again, they inflicted that on me as oral training. Um, that's not so much atonal as tonal ear training. Uh, so they would play a melody. In fact, they would play a four-part melody, a string quartet or something. And they'd play it four times, and they'd expect me to have written it out. No perfect by the end of it, things like that. And um, the whole point of this book is that you start simply, and you get better and better. Uh, Suzuki Method. Who, who's heard of Suzuki Method? It's quite famous. Okay. Suzuki Method is uh, for learning string instruments mainly. And um, it's basically show and copy, show and copy, show and copy. And um, they also get the parent of the child to learn along as well. Uh, but the problem with that with uh, show and copy, show and copy, is that you'll get a student who might be able to play the Mendelssohn violin concerto, but not much else, really. So um, this is a problem with uh, having particular systems that you might follow. Uh, people get kind of rather obsessed with them. Um, um, well, the Suzuki method it doesn't work for everyone, and that's the same for any method. So I would advise uh, or encourage people, if you can safely ignore a system, um, you know, if something else works for you. Um, and in the very worst cases, they can do a lot of damage, like produce students that I've met that could play some fantastic pieces of music in the audition, but when you actually sit them in an orchestra, they're just stuck there like puddings, not being able to do anything, um, which is not very nice for them, as well as for you. Um, also, it's, in, it's tempting to be impressed and uh, follow and listen to people who, who offer systems and methodologies and, and, and speak in mysterious ways. Um, and I'd encourage you to be cynical um, with these sorts of people and, and ask questions of them. Um, just like we do in Georgia, we ask questions of each other. You know, why are you writing it like that? You know, why did you make that piece of code work in the way it did there? Um, so basically learn to practice learning, really. Um, and yeah, that's a pithy aphorism. Um, <laughs> so I'll wrap up and say, uh, I'm kind of with Socrates. Um, don't just blindly follow what other people say or do. Um, make up your own mind. Uh, cultivate autonomy. Autonomy is a rather important concept in philosophy of education because um, that's basically what the teacher is aiming for, um, is for autonomous students. They're trying to do themselves out of the job, basically. Um, if you're ever in London, come along and say hi. Uh, I advertise on the Python UK mailing list. Um, uh, is that the one that yours got to you? No. No, it's not. Okay, binary beer bottles.
Thanks for that installation. Um, so I have a question for you guys. Um, after you've seen this talk, how many of you are going to go home and uh, organize something like a code project? Try it. Yeah, you try it. It's not, it's not easy, especially when you have to find people which are as motivated as you. Um, you need to find people which are motivated, that's the only problem. Yeah, absolutely. Because they thought it just fails epically. Well, <laughs> yeah, it depends. I mean, in London, we've got quite a large Python community anyway. And uh, we've got about 15 or 16 core attendees at the Dojo. And uh, we, our Dojo is only about 30. I encourage you to talk to them. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, <laughs> The thing, what you might like to do then is, um, is try and coordinate with another group, maybe a whole bunch of Ruby developers, and solve the same problem in Ruby, which is kind of as readable as, well, almost as readable as Python. Um, you can use the compare and contrast with them as well. So you don't have to just try and target one particular. No, no, no. Um, I'm not targeting any particular language. I'm mm. saying, for me, it would be okay, you know, it's not a language oriented. Just the whole concept of this dojo is really, really interesting. Mm. Problem is that in any case, you should come to Plymouth and see it yourself. Yeah, yeah, I quite understand. Yeah, absolutely. Um, is it clear what you might, what you do in a dojo? If I explain this properly. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Any more questions? You eat pizza and you drink beer, right? We eat. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we, we eat pizza. We drink beer. We decide a problem, we solve it in groups, and we give ourselves about an hour and a half, and at the end, we tell each other what we've been up to. And that's it, that's five steps. It's not rocket science. No, 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 I already did the first. Okay, yeah. fantastic. Yeah, I was going to say if you're in Italy, then you have something more or less there. Bruno? Yeah, in London, you have quite a big, uh, a big Python community. What if you don't have any local community? Would you uh, start a dojo and try to build a community around it, or start doing something else, and then use that community in I, I suppose that depends on the, the situation you find yourself in, really. Um, for example, you know, Bruno used to live quite close by to me, Norman Keynes. We could have started a Python dojo where we were, because I can see at least two people who live within 10 miles, or who have lived within 10 miles of where I live, and there's some Michael and other people around. So we could have about six to seven people, and we could do a randori-based dojo, rather than group-based dojo. But if you're stuck out in the sticks, like four down the front row in the internal, then it might be better to figure out where's the closest big city and aim for that. Um, so, you know, Southampton or something like that. Um, I suppose it depends on, on the context, really. Um, it's a question of that. Yeah, I that's not a question. Uh, in Italy, we uh, did dojo, uh, I think, four years ago, yeah. uh, from uh, Bernard uh, from Paris, and uh, I met Bernard in uh, Munich, yeah. and we did a uh, dojo in Milan for uh, three years, and uh, we used dojo to learn uh, uh, languages. The last dojo I did. Uh, I show Python 3 yeah. and uh, receive, uh, uh, there was a uh, Rubynest uh, people uh, that uh, use Ruby and it was very interesting to, to compare the two, the two solutions and there was uh, even Java people and so on. Uh, I, I don't think it's possible to start uh, a community with Dojo because it's, uh, it, at, at least in Italy, is a little bit um, uh, noisy and uh, you, have to, you have to know the people if you want to uh, s uh, fail safely. Yeah, yeah so um, it's also well, if there are people you know speaking and you know obviously not too much, but not even like no one speaking at all and just people concentrated. It would take the fun away from it. Yeah, yeah it's, up, it's up to the person who is organizing or is being kind of the MC to, to make sure that it doesn't get out of hand. Yeah, you have to. Yeah, but to trust the people uh, with uh, with uh, uh, well, if you're coding with someone you don't trust, uh, you can't fail it safely. You can uh, you cannot show your um, your um, very very deep uh, yeah. aching side. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions, John? Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, just one thing with uh, organizing uh, 
media groups and stuff. And I, I, I recently went from a guy just organising on a mailing list using, using meetup.com, this is for a group in Australia, and just the, the number of people that, that turned up because we were using a central organising website as opposed to just a, a mailing list was, we doubled the size when we did that. So if you're trying to organise a group, I really recommend having some kind of website support. I mean, I've got comps about good in the problems. Yes, yeah, absolutely. We, I announced it on the UK menu list, but we use um, not me to one of the other ones, um, and people book tickets, so we set it up to 30 people, otherwise it just gets out of hand. Um, and we, when, when I announce it, the tickets are sold out within about six hours. So it's, it's very popular. John? Yeah, uh, my version of the job is two things. The first is that when you're coding, you've got a version of the job, you think, oh, well, I don't have to do it right now, because I can change it later, which is true, but you'd rather do it right now. Mm -hmm. I think that's part of the concentrated formal thing. Yeah. But the other thing is, uh, I've got into the habit now of um, making a commit whenever I can. So sort of every 15 minutes or so, to make a commit with a one-line mm. one line message. I can do it that way, I like to do it that way. Now, what my sort of question or sort of, you're doing stuff in the dojo, mm. and a version of the control record of the files might be quite useful and interesting. Um, they so, could be anonymous, you know? Yeah, absolutely. So when we do the randomly recaps up, at the end of each 10 minutes slot or part of the unit test, that's a commit. And it'll be two people who make, you know, who was the pilot, who was the co-pilot, who was the comment about, you know, whatever it was that they were doing. Um, we did, uh, last year, we did um, a dojo, project that was based over several dojos. So we tried to write an old school adventure game, text-based adventure game. And each month we would um, we would choose a problem from the domain, try and solve it. And um, at the end of the show and tell we would bless one solution and that would go into GitHub or wherever um, and, and form the basis of the next iteration. So, for example, the first, e the first evening we did that, we, um, the problem was represent the game well. And, uh, well, it's a good example for lots of reasons. Um, so most of the groups, I think four out of five groups, had a directed graph with where there was a node for each room and the edges that were the, the, the routes between um, all the rooms. Um, and that was a lot of fun. But one group, they did some sort of weird grid-based system that, that organically grew out of nothing. Um, and they failed spectacularly. But it was really interesting to see why they did that and explain themselves. You know, we got so far, you know, we're half an hour into this, we committed ourselves to this way of doing it, and then we realized well, we've made a big mistake here. And this is why we made this big mistake. Um, so, um, yeah, so we use version control in that instance. When we're doing single problems in an evening, um, people kind of get brownie points. If they have unit tests, um, and if they have uh, version control, I suppose, although I've never actually seen version control when we've been doing um, group, um, group based versions. Um, so, yeah. Lawrence. That comment about version control made me think about something. We did, we can do code coaches, yeah. but this was a work when we, like, when. Uh, get new people or people who try trying to basically increase the bus number. So if there was something to code that like one or two people understood, yeah. and more people needed to understand it, so we would have two people up front uh, hacking on something. Yeah. And um, but since other people, we wanted other people to hack on it as well. And we the problem we the reason that we uh, needed to do something was that um, we had two people that were Emacs uh, users, mm -hmm. and then we had a bunch of heretics. Mm -hmm. uh, and, <laughs> We needed some way of having the, of getting this to work. Yeah. So what we did now, the the, uh, the good thing that we had was of course that we controlled all of the machines. So what we did was we put no machine on them. We just had a dedicated box that so we you, you, you could literally just use show your own desktop. Mm -hmm. And uh, the reason that source control checks uh, works with that is of course because you need source control yeah. to keep the source synchronized yeah. between different people. I don't know if that might be too much tech for a dojo. Yeah, it, it, but seriously, the, um, we try and be as lightweight as possible um, because, as we found out in the first dojo, um, you know, if people 
on using your your development environment is a kind of a very personal space. Um, if you're given some users MacBook with Vim on it, and you're an Emacs user who uses Ubuntu, then you're you know you're screwed basically. You're, you're spending half your time trying to figure out what the hell is happening. Um, but I think you made an excellent point, and it addresses the guy from Plymouth. Um, thank you. Um, <laughs> Uh, you do it at work, and organising a dojo at work um, is a great way to increase the bus number, as you say. And if you were to do something like a Randori Kata, where you had more experienced coders who were always um, paired with less experienced coders or new, new, new hires or something like that, it's a great way of spreading um, information. And also for the new hires, in a safe environment to go, I'm sorry, I haven't got a clue what you're about or why this is working and what this is doing. Because it's forcing the people who are there already to go over their decisions and say, look, we built it this way because of this, that, and the other reasons. And uh, it's, it's, yeah. So. We had a, a little bit with more strict uh, teacher student model, mostly because like we had seriously arcane pieces of Fortran. Yeah. Um, and, uh, <laughs> So uh, it was a bit more of a teacher student model. We didn't, we didn't really do the rotation. But yeah. I figured, you know, if you do it with, like, with, like you said, with Python and you solve problems that no one is, that you don't have where one person in the room is like ridiculously more advanced than everyone else, then, you know. So they could be the co-pilot and you only rotate on me on, on pilot, for example. So there's always somebody looking over your shoulder who knows this piece of code and you can ask dark questions. So, um, we're talking of questions. Any more questions? Yeah, sorry for having you. No, 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 wait, that's why I'm that. So, so where do you do these in a bar in your house? <laughs> okay, so um, I better mention um, that. Um, uh, so I used to be contracting for a company called Fry IT. Um, and Courtier works there, and Bruno, who sat the other side of you, was an intern there. Um, and um, so I proposed this idea, and they support the community by letting others use their office for free. They, uh, they pay for the pizza and the beer. And another way that we're helped out is that Olai, in fact, Josette downstairs uh, every month, she sends me a Python book. And if you look at some of the pictures of uh, guys in the dojo, channel, you'll notice that they're all wearing name tags. Okay, that's kind of important because if you're new there, you need to be able to know other people's names and people say who you are as well. But also at the end, everybody takes their name tag off and put it in a box. Choose someone around them and they walk away with a free party book from their library, um, which is kind of nice as well. But it's organized in, in some, some small company's office. Um, uh, have you ever been to a free program? No. No. Um, this is all... We looked into, like I said, we looked into what the Prusian dojo rules were, myself and Jonathan and some of the other guys, and we, we thought, okay, we're going to do it like this. This is really quite good. It's formal. It's structured. What could go wrong? And as you know, it, it, it all went actually horribly right. You know, and like I say, we, we, we took the concept and we forked it and we, we adapted. We, well, I wouldn't say we forked it up. We forked with it. Yes, we we adapted it to our to our particular group's needs. So, the, perhaps the best takeaway that you can have from this talk is: well, you've heard what we do. You've heard what the guys in Paris do. Now, try and you know, work with that and then use that as the basis of something that you might want to do as well. And it, it will be different for you as well. I'm assuming, mind you, our Python developers are the same everywhere in the world. Um, if that's the case, then yeah, you're onto a winner. Any more questions? Okay, thank you.